Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us to the latest in our series, generously sponsored by the Lehman Foundation. My name is Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement here at the Fairfield University Art Museum. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Martina Droth. She is the Deputy Director of Research and Curator of Sculpture at the Yale Center for British Art. She is also the chair of the Association of Research Institutions of Art History and co-editor of the Born Digital and Peer Review Journal, British Art Studies. Dr. Drop holds a PhD in the history of art from the University of Reading, and her research focuses on sculpture and interdisciplinary approaches to practice, materials, and modes of display, with a particular emphasis on British sculpture of the 19th and 20th centuries. Among her curatorial and co-curatorial projects at the Yale Center for British Art, have been the 2017 exhibition Things of Beauty Growing, British Studio Pottery, and the 2014 Sculpture Victorious Art in an Age and Invention, 1837 to 1901, which traveled to the Tate Britain the following year. And by this point, you may be wondering why we have invited a specialist in British sculpture to speak in connection with our ongoing exhibition of sculptures by the very French, Auguste Rodin, which if you have not seen it yet in our Walsh Gallery, we hope you will. Uh, the connection lies in Rodin's fascination with plaster casts, a subject that we're going to be hearing a lot more about this evening. In 2017, Dr. Droth co-organized part of a symposium at Yale and also at CUNY entitled Casting the Curriculum, the Parthenon Marbles, Plaster Casts, and Public Sculpture. And among the speakers was our very own Dr. Kathy Schwab, who is the curator of the university's plaster cast collection, which includes more than 100 historic plaster casts including many from the Parthenon in Athens, which was a particular site of fascination for Rodin. And it was from that connection that our invitation to Dr. Droth originated. So I look forward to learning much more about the intersection of plaster casts and 19th century sculpture tonight. Dr. Droth. Thank you so much, um, Michelle. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really um, pleased to be here. Just gonna move this over a little bit. Um, yeah, and um, thank you all for coming. Can you hear me? Am I near enough to the mic? No. No. Okay. Um, do I need to stand as close as this? Okay, I can hear it. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. Let's start. So, when I was a student in, um, in the 1990s, Rodin was kind of everywhere. I don't know if you still, still feel that way now um, in, your own, in your own lives, but um, I was studying sculpture, um, as Michelle just mentioned, um, British but also European sculpture, and there was just no getting away from Rodin. He was really the most dominant and inescapable presence in, in, in my field. And this was borne out um, in scholarly books, also in exhibitions um, and museums. And from the very beginning, Rodin represented an interesting contradiction to me. His work and the way that it was talked about was all about innovation, originality, modernization, and the radical break from tradition. And, and often he was presented as a kind of a foil to um, the Beaux-Arts tradition, you know, that he was, he was the one who overturned that kind of neoclassical style. And yet, um, for modern viewers, whether it be museum visitors or tourists or art historians, um, the, the work was also incredibly familiar and ubiquitous, uh, very, very well known, and um, almost, I would say, to the point of kitsch. And I'm just showing you this piece because I think it's so recognizable, um, whether people are interested in sculpture or not, it's, it's just such an iconic um, work. And we can think of many other artists and works like this, and I think Degas' Little Dancer is another really great other example in that, in that vein. We see so many reproductions of this work in many museums, and it's become this kind of sweet thing um, and uh, it's a very long way away from the, the radical and daring um, and highly critiqued work that it was at the time of its making. So, um, so those two things have long been in this kind of tension, and I think they still are, and there continues to be room to explore that. Back in the 1990s, uh, the discussions around Rodin were, were really quite exciting. Um, and um, perhaps especially because the stakes were so high, given Rodin's phenomenal reputation um, and his ongoing and incredibly high market value, 
He was this significant, um, unusually kind of international global figure through which intellectual arguments uh, could be explored in such a way that they really meant something um, to the field as a whole. So he was a kind of a focal point for certain big ideas and debates. And he was also the subject of blockbuster exhibitions. And those two aspects um, come together in a very interesting way in 1982 in a well-known argument, or well-known as far as art history goes, which played out in the pages of October, um, the sort of high-level intellectual journal. And that debate revolved around exhibitions and markets, reproductions and materials, and specifically centered on the posthumous casting of Rodin's works. And it was between two very famous art historians, Albert Elson, who was a Stanford professor of art history and a Rodin expert, uh, a consultant to Gerald Cantor, and he played a big role in the building up of the Stanford collection, um, I believe the largest, the second largest collection of Rodin's work in the world. Um, and of course, these, we have some of those examples in this exhibition here at Fairfield. So there was Albert Elson on one side, and on the other side was the art historian and Columbia professor Rosalind Krauss. So they represented two art historical generations and, and very different approaches to thinking about sculpture and modernism. And what happened in 1982 was that Krauss wrote an article on Rodin, taking as her starting point a blockbuster exhibition called Rodin Rediscovered, which was held at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And here you see an installation view of that exhibition, which she published in, in her article. The exhibition was curated by Albert Elson, the aforementioned, together with Kurt Barnado and Ruth Butler. Krauss's article essentially questioned the validity of a 1978 bronze cast of The Gates of Hell, which was a kind of a showpiece work in this major exhibition, and you can see it right there, sort of towering over the rest of the space. Um, and by the way, if you um, if you look at the um, archived web page of, um, for this exhibition on the National Gallery uh, website, you'll see that it had over a million visitors. So when I say that the stakes were high, um, I think that's a good illustration of that. Here's a, a view of, um, of the bronze cast. Um, some of you studying or uh, teaching art history will, of course, know these names, Elson, Krauss, Kurt Monado. Their work is very well inscribed into the literature now. At the time that I was a student, this was kind of, um, or had recently unfolded, it was still very fresh. Elson died in 1995. He had been a really prominent name, and, um, and especially in the field of sculpture studies. And even if you're studying British sculpture, there's just, there was just no escaping Rodin. Um, and Elson's whole identity as a scholar, as a professor, and as an art historian was that he was the leading authority on Rodin. And if you look up his obituary, that's exactly what it says. And it tells us something important um, in relation to this debate, his investment in it. And also, I think, in relation to um, how art history gets shaped, Elson helped drive forward the reputation of Rodin. He played a really big role in reviving it. So Rodin wasn't always this outsized figure. It didn't happen all by itself. And in fact, as Leo Steinberg reminds us in his really great 1963 classic essay called Rodin, which he um, republished in his collection, Other Criteria, which I recommend you all to read, um, he reminds us that MoMA, until 1955, did not own a single Rodin. The Met, he says, had some Rodins, but showed only their marbles, keeping the bronzes in storage, and the small plasters, which, which had come with this gift that they had received directly from Rodin himself, um, hadn't been shown since they had arrived in 1913. And maybe some of you who've been to the Met recently will know that they, they have made a big effort in, in the last couple of years to redisplay um, their Rodin gift. So Rodin um, was being reshaped for art history in the second half of the 20th century. And Elson and, and Cantor were part of this revival, and therefore we have to think of Elson as a kind of architect, or a major architect of the narrative that I think still um, rests very much with Rodin today. Rosalind Krauss, meanwhile, was publishing a lot of really important work that was reshaping the field in a, in a new way, reshaping um, the kind of thinking um, um, and moving away from, um, from scholars like Elson. 
arguably not to the same popular impact, um, even though, of course, she's an incredibly important person in the field of art history. Krause's account of the gates of hell and of, of Rodin, um, those articles from 1982, still stand as um, incredibly nuanced and thoughtful um, discussions about notions of authenticity and originality. She noted that the gates of hell had been left incomplete at the time of Rodin's death, that the posthumous casting was sanctioned by Rodin in his will when he, he gave um, all of his materials to the, to the French state and was taken forward by the state and it's perfectly legal and legitimate and um, casts continue to be made um, as, as this exhibition demonstrates into the, um, into the 80s and they retain that right to produce up to 12 um, editions of each plaster. But in her article, Krauss also calls out the elephant in the room and she began um, by commenting on a film that had been made about the casting of, um, of the gates. So I'm quoting from her, um, from her article. To some, though hardly all, of the people sitting in that theater in the museum, watching the casting of the gates of hell, it must have occurred that they were witnessing the making of a fake. After all, Rodin had been dead since 1918, and surely a work of his produced more than 60 years after his death cannot be the genuine article, cannot, that is, be an original. However, the answer to this is more interesting than one might think, for the answer is neither yes nor no. Um, and I hope you got in this brief extract the fact she's not saying that the gates of hell is a fake. She's saying that some of those thoughts arise and wants to question um, the contradiction that they appear to point to. She makes an analogy between bronze casting and the making of photographs, right, printing from negatives, and she questions the cult of originality that is so hard at work in the kinds of terms and expectations that exist around works of art. And her central aim, if we were to uh, put it in a sentence, was to get away from the binary language of original versus reproduction and point out the productive tension between Rodin's own ethos of reproduction and then, on the other hand, the rhetoric of originality that uh, was used to characterize Rodin's work and his reception, and the reception of modernism. Albert Elson, in his infuriated response, flatly dismissed Krauss's argument, and either he, he couldn't or refused to see the nuance um, of, of the argument. And then there's a further episode um, to, this, to this disagreement when Krauss followed up on Elson's letter with her own response. And it's really an incredible piece of writing. Um, she dismantles Elson's letter piece by piece in, a, in an incredibly beautiful, um, unaggressive and, um, but conclusive manner. And that letter was later reprinted as a chapter uh, called Sincerely Yours in her um, seminal, groundbreaking and still incredibly important book, The Original, Originality of the Avant-Garde and Other Modernist Myths. And the title of that book refers back to this discussion about the National Gallery's Rodin exhibition. So it's a really important moment in art history, and I think it still stands today as an incredibly interesting argument when we think about um, an artist like Rodin today. So that was my, um, that was my initial introduction to Rodin, these, these, um, these debates, and um, they left a big impression on me. And then in the year 2000, just as I was finishing my PhD, I saw an exhibition in Paris that um, stayed with me ever since, which um, you know, not all exhibitions do that. It was organized by the Musée Rodin, and it meticulously uh, reconstructed this seminal solo show of Rodin's work exactly 100 years earlier. This is a one-man show in 1900 um, at Place de l'Arma, which, which Rodin um, himself organized. And here is um, a photograph taken in 1900, an installation view of the exhibition as it looked. And I have one, sadly only one, um, installation image of the reconstructed exhibition that I saw in the year 2000. Um, in those days, um, photography was much more restricted in museums than it is now, um, and of course we didn't, we didn't have phones uh, with cameras. So, <laughs> so I just have this one shot, but maybe it's enough to, um, you know, to give you to show you what, what they were trying to do in trying to um, set up Rodin's sculpture in a way that he had done a um, hundred years earlier. This exhibition was a really eye-opening moment for me um, 
because for all the theoretical arguments, you always have to come back to the object and to the experience of the work. And, and that usually takes place in museums and in exhibitions, which for better or for worse, structure these encounters for us. And I fell in love with this idea of the, of the reconstruction, which um, of course is incredibly flawed and probably not always a good idea um, because it suggests a truth that probably introduces lots of falsehoods too. But nevertheless, the, the intention is there to get back to a moment in time, to get back to something closer to, to what was once intended. But more than that also, because it means we're thinking not only of the object as this autonomous unit, an isolated thing, we're acknowledging the role that the conditions of viewing bring. And we're thinking about what people saw, what they might have experienced, and what they might have taken away from that. So it's thinking with um, a different mode. And I think these intentions are really, are really interesting, um, especially for curators uh, to, to, to prompt us to think different curatorial approaches. And it was really um, partly through this exhibition that I became very interested in two things, which may seem like two different things, but I think they're very interrelated. And that is display on the one hand, and materials on the other. Uh, what I find striking about um, some of the images of Rodin's 1900 exhibition is precisely those two things. How the work is displayed, curated, and the materials that we see. And that's plaster, and um, plaster and more plaster, photographs and drawings, all in one space. The reconstructed 1900 exhibition uh, made me think about how those factors play into um, the ways in which we think about artists, what we decide to prioritize in terms of what we want to get out of the work, our understanding of it. And I began to appreciate that the environment and the presentational mode are very influential, as are the kinds of selections that we make. You know, what we choose to show, we can show, we can show a very different Rodin depending on what we choose from the, the massive um, archive that he left behind. But back in my student days, I decided that materials and display would be something that I would prioritize. And I've been so fortunate that I've been able to do that in my work as an art historian and, and a curator of sculpture. And, um, and I've long been struck how, in, you know, in my field, 19th and early 20th century sculpture, the material variety is incredibly rich. And yet, um, not only does that variety not always come over, but I wonder how much we really think about materials at all. So today we have very different kinds of viewing and display conventions, and there is an art museum aesthetic that's that we're very accustomed to, that, that feels very normal. We don't really need to think about them so much. Um, and what, I, what really struck me about this show, beautifully installed here at Fairfield, is that um, as well as being about Rodin and a kind of an introduction to Rodin and his work, it is also about bronze and about reproduction and technology, even though that's not the theme that sort of sits at the surface of the show. But this whole show consists of bronzes, um, and yet, and I'd love to talk with you about this, this later, I wonder if it means that it makes us think about bronze more, or if in fact it makes us think about bronze less. Um, because material has, as I have found, it has this strange habit of kind of disappearing on us. So I guess that's what I'm saying about materials and display being interrelated, um, that one can activate the other. And they, and they often do so in unexpected ways. In these images of the Alma exhibition, it's easy to see that Rodin really cared about the pedestals on which his work was shown, um, and he really cared about plaster. The pedestals are plaster copies of architectural elements, and his own sculptures sitting on top of those columns are also made of plaster. So it's really striking, this overwhelming presence of plaster. And another thing that really struck me about this show and how Rodin chose to present himself was the gates of hell. Um, let me return to this bronze version, um, which I think many of us are very familiar with. This is the work that sparked Rosalind Krauss's interest in this dynamic relationship between the original and the reproduction. And this is always the way I thought about this work. 
But the version that was shown in 1900 and in the reconstructed year 2000 exhibition, it didn't look like this. Um, and I'm afraid because it wasn't possible to take installation pictures, I wasn't able to take a picture of um, the gates of hell in the show. And this is the closest image I've been able to find to how I remember experiencing it um, when I walked through that exhibition. Um, and this is actually a picture of it in 1900 in the process of being installed at the Place de Lama for, for Rodin's one man show. And I hope you can see even from this, um, from this rather poor image that it was a rather undefined thing without all of the figures being really clearly marked out. And today I think the figures on the gates seem like the most important thing um, about them. But here, you, know, you can see that Rodin was happy to present a work in progress, not this incredibly elaborate finished thing. So the very insistence on plaster is an insistence on leaving something open-ended. It suggests potentialities rather than conclusions. And so I became very interested in plaster and the many different roles that it plays as a material in the, in the history of sculpture. There are two um, sort of primary ways in which plaster was used in the 19th century. Um, it was used as a material for the reproduction and dissemination of monuments, famous statues, or pieces of uh, architectural elements, and these study collections. And you can see that catalogues were produced from which you could order plaster reproductions. Um, art schools, modeling instructors, artists might buy whole sets of such objects and put together a canon. And this was considered so important in terms of education and culture in the 19th century that it prompted the creation of an international convention, an agreement between various foreign governments to allow and encourage this practice. Molds could be taken from original monuments. I mean, imagine such a thing today, right? From the Vatican, the British Museum, original works, and commercial producers were allowed to create and market plaster cast reproductions of these masterpieces. And um, as you will know from this collection, plaster is an incredible material. It's very faithful and it you know, can pick up every detail. The big producer in Britain was Bruciani. Uh, he had a workshop in the British Museum, right? That tells you something about how central this was. He was casting those treasures for dissemination around the world. Here in the USA, the big producer was Caproni and um, you can, um, they're still active. You can go and see their historical collection and you can still order plaster casts um, from historical molds. Um, and of course, um, we have the Fairfield collection of plaster casts, many of them made you know, at that time when the plaster cast was seen as so important. And um, there are many other art school collections around this country that still have these um, intact plaster collections. And, um, and Rodin had his own collection of plaster casts after the antique, and you can view them today in Paris. So that's one very important facet of the plaster casting industry in the 19th century. A second important way in which plaster was used was, of course, as part and parcel of the creative process. Um, and the plaster model is the most important, crucial object in traditional sculptural practices. Whether the end product was to be bronze or marble, um, the starting point for a sculpture was usually clay, right? modeled clay, or sometimes wax, but clay most commonly. Clay is incredibly unstable. On a large scale, it just doesn't last. And so as soon as a sculptor made a clay model, a plaster mold would be made from it, destroying the clay in the process. The mold then presents a negative right, of the object, which you cast into a positive, into a plaster. And your plaster becomes the work, and often sculptors would refer to it as the plaster original. Right? It was such a crucial stage in the process. So plaster generally takes the form of something that already exists, um, and these two ways that I have just described in which plaster was used, of course they stand sort of at opposite ends, and in the first instance I talked about an extant finished work in marble or bronze being molded and cast to make a replica, and in the second instance, the plaster serves as a stage to producing um, a finished work further down the line. Um, in this picture, going back to Rodin's Plaster Lama exhibition, we can see both of those uses of plaster at work. 
Rodin is using plaster casts of architectural elements and he's using plaster as a creative material for his, for his work, which may or may not subsequently be turned into bronze or, or marble. And, and in many cases, all we have is, is the plaster and no other version was necessarily made. So I want to just talk a little bit more about um, the sculptural process. And there's a nice introductory paragraph in the, in the brochure to this exhibition, and I'll, I'll read it to you because I think it's quite relevant to us. So it says, if you walked into Rodin's studio and showroom, most likely you would not have known if the year was 1897 or 1597. Although he was untraditional in many ways, Rodin produced his sculpture by following traditional studio practices virtually unchanged from those of the great sculptors of the Renaissance and later periods. And I think this makes a really great point and I want to explore it a little more. So in traditional sculptural practices, the sort of single form that we end up with, that we look at, that we see, um, is the result of, of many other processes that are typically um, augmented, translated multiple times into different materials and dimensions, commonly involving metal, wood, clay, wax, plaster, marble and bronze. So the final object that we most often see um, or engage with, say in a museum or in a public square, are the aggregation of other objects that sort of stand behind it. Um, before we even get to the plaster, there is this whole cumulative use of tools and materials, the involvement of multiple makers, many sets of hands and skills, a carpenter, a metalsmith for the armature, a molder, a caster, all of these are specialized um, uh, crafts. And I'm just showing you this um, sequence of images from a sculptor's manual. Um, someone you may not have heard of, Albert Toft, a British sculptor contemporaneous with Rodin, a great admirer of Rodin. Um, um, and many of these manuals were published at the end of the 19th century to show how that process worked. And it's very clear that sculpture is rarely the result of a singular or one authored process. Once we get to the plaster, a whole other set of processes and circumstances kick in. Um, in in um, the huge archive that exists of photographs of Rodin's work in his studio um, to, in his, from his lifetime, there isn't that much that sets out the process, there's nothing that sets out the process quite as explicitly as this, but we can piece some of that evidence together um, that makes it clear that Rodin really did work with these very sort of similar um, methods, traditional methods. Um, to give you an example, um, here is his um, monument to Victor Hugo in uh, bronze in a public square. Um, it was cast into bronze after Rodin's death, um, but we do have an interesting record of how he had envisaged it. Um, here is uh, the plaster set up on a rudimentary platform on a rock, so you can see that plaster casts were used um, to cite a work, to situate it, position it, let other people see it uh, in its <coughs> intended surroundings, um, the people who commissioned it, for instance. Um, and in fact, this piece was ultimately rejected, which is why it wasn't cast in his lifetime. Um, here you see it back at the studio with other plaster um, figures being, um, being attached to it, um, Victor Hugo's muses. And, uh, and let's just point out what we can observe here. First of all, we see Rodin uh, in a suit, looking on, not working. We see two people in overcoats working. And we see these plaster figures being assembled. Um, you can see, first of all, they themselves are assembled from pieces. You can see the mold lines um, in, on the arm, for instance. Um, and you can see the sort of makeshift construction to get these pieces to stand together and to work together in a particular way, like crates and pieces of wood. So the work is really being kind of collaged together. It's being um, assembled from parts. It's not modeled as, as a whole coherent unit from the outset, as we might sometimes imagine. And um, here we see the same work from a different angle. Again, Rodin is with it, but not working on it as such. Um, and I want to draw attention to a figure that you can just see, um, sort of, at work. Um, he's got this cross-shaped instrument, which is a pointing machine. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the pointing machine, uh, which is not really a machine at all. It's a simple wooden frame, held together with um, clamps and nails, very rudimentary. And to this frame is attached a very 
precise um, measuring instrument, um, a needle, which um, you can sort of retract. And, um, and the needle is used to measure individual points on the plaster. Um, and this is a pointing model. Um, the big lumpy bits of metal are where you would guide that frame, that wooden frame, um, between this plaster and the block of marble. And then you can also see those little, those little marks, like pop marks, and those are um, little nails that have been hammered into the plaster. And sometimes it wouldn't be nails, um, it might be, can you see the little pencil cross marks? Um, I think this hand would break, this is Hiram Powers' Greek slave, by the way, his pointing model. Um, and you can see, and you would break the fingers if you were to put nails into it. So sometimes it's just a little um, cross mark, just marked out in pencil. And what happens is that the frame is moved from plaster to marble again and again and again. Um, and here you can see a studio where um, the plaster is set up next to the marble. Um, and um, a measurement has been taken from a point on the plaster and, is, and the frame has been moved onto the marble um, and the marble will be chiseled to try and get to that same depth. A single figure can entail hundreds and even thousands of points um, and each statue can take months, months to make. Um, and I took these pictures um, in, um, in the Italian town of Pietra Santa in Tuscany, um, a marble-rich area that has made this town um, historically important uh, for sculpture. Sorry, one more picture where you can just see, um, you can see what happens. Um, and in the end, you, you join up all of these points. Um, and, this, and this was taken in this studio um, run by someone called Marco Giannoni, and for generations this studio has specialised in translating sculptor's model into exacting marble replicas. And I was visiting um, a sculptor called Kevin Francis Gray, who was responsible for that form there that you can see, um, and I was writing about his work for Pace Gallery, and amazingly had access to this, to this workshop to see the work they carried out there, which you can map onto descriptions published in the 19th century about sculptural practice almost um, exactly, with, with hardly any variation. And um, I'm going to try and show you two film clips. So this, so you can see the plaster with the frame, the pointing machine in the background, and you can see that um, this is a very early stage of roughing out the marble. He's not even using the frame right now. He's sort of ascertained where his points are um, and is manually chiseling that block. And, um, and then just another very, very short clip. You can see perhaps here that um, this is actually, um, I took these films at the same time. And this is another sculpture that was at a, at a further stage of, um, of production. You can hear the sound of a drill. Um, so some of these um, artisans are still using just a hammer and chisel, and some of them are using um, a chisel that's um, electrically powered. That's the only change that, that's really happened since, um, since the 19th century. So you can see the, the pointing frame set up. Um, and he's creating these little sort of notches under the arm so that he can then um, excavate that area. So 
looks both crude and precise. I have enormous respect for these people who are making this work. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get back to my presenter view. Um, Okay, so I realize this exhibition is about bronze, um, but whether you're turning something into bronze or marble, um, I wanted to just show you how, um, how we can think about the labor and the craft, the skill, the steps, the time involved in, in making the objects that we see in our galleries, but where we don't necessarily think so much about the material. And yet each of these objects has been through so much. Um, and um, I think, and I'd love to um, hear your thoughts on this, uh, I feel there's often a perceptual disconnect in, in um, you know, when we encounter a piece of sculpture in a gallery. You know, how, should we, how should we look at it? Should we really look at it, right? In all its surface particulars, the material characteristics, the facture, the kind of skin, surface polish, the color? Or are we essentially looking through it to get at a larger idea, at a conception to which the material is essentially a means to an end. You know, the material captures and renders an idea. Now, are we kind of thinking beyond the physical thing almost? Um, and here um, in the exhibition, of course, we have this lovely small figure of St. John the Baptist in bronze. Um, it also exists as a very large figure. Um, here it is in the, in the plaster gallery of the uh, Musée Rodin. And these two works are obviously related. But I'm not sure that we have as yet um, found sort of very good methods for thinking about that relationship and how it informs our viewing. Um, what are we looking at and what are we looking for in each of these works? Do we need to know about one in order to understand the other? Or does the plaster or the small bronze present a, a sufficiently tangible rendering of an idea? And um, I don't really have an answer to that. Um, I think my, my answer is to raise awareness about materials and process, and to say that the very existence of versions, variations, replicas, models, editions, reproductions, is actually really interesting and points us back to the most common uh, facets and characteristics of sculptural practice. Um, it's part and parcel of, of what sculpture is, and I think we can make a virtue of that and pay attention to what objects entail as things um, in their own right. And there's a universe of, uh, of meta-concepts that we could think about, subtleties, concepts like intermedial dialogues, medium sensitivity, medium translation, and modalities of materials and material perceptions. I think there's, there's sort of the absence of better terms of reference often allows sculpture's distinctive processes to be quite sort of commonly channeled into these rather blunt, polarized um, binaries. And maybe that makes us a little bit blind um, to materials. So really, all of this brings us back to um, Krauss and Elson. I'm not claiming to have advanced um, their arguments, um, but I really wanted to sort of present to you um, my love and appreciation of materials, my fascination with plaster as something that's often seen as, um, as kind of transient and intermediary, and almost, we're almost not really seeing it because we're waiting for the next thing afterwards. And how can we get to um, a different kind of looking where we see each object as something in its own right? Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Anybody have any? So, in a perfect world for you, would any exhibition of Rodin's work involve sort of multiple modalities? So there would be a plaster, maybe many plasters, next to a bronze, next to a photograph, or next to a something other as a drawing in the process? Um, I think it all depends on what you want the exhibition to do. So, no, I don't really have, have that. But I guess my curatorial impulse would probably be to, um, to bring different media together and to do something that I feel um, it's difficult to do in the permanently curated exhibition space, at least in my museum. We're very, um, we're very wedded to our categories, you know, prints and drawings, photographs, 
paintings and sculptures. Um, and I love exhibitions as opportunities where we can break down those silos and begin different kinds of conversations. So I don't think um, anything is right or wrong, um, but my own sort of um, passion is, is about um, sort of piecing things back together. Um, I, I'm wondering, following up with what Michelle has asked, it seems like what the Met has now done with Rodin Gallery, that huge space, and they clearly are rethinking. Um, it's not just a transit corridor to the temporary exhibition. People are really stopping, and they're looking, and there is a wonderful mix between terracottas, uh, marble, bronze, and then plaster casts. Uh, it seems like the one thing they're missing maybe are video clips or photographs or maybe both, and then they could get into this a little more. I don't know if other exhibitions of specifically Rodin sculpture, permanent uh, exhibitions, um, do that or installations. Is the Met sort of moving in a leading in this way? Um, or it's joining? Yeah, and maybe it's joining rather. I, I don't know. Uh, oh. I don't want to insult the Met. I love what they've done with their Rodin collection. It's really, really well done. And when they first opened it, they had a little exhibition of photographs and works on paper, which was then dismantled because you can't keep that material up on the roof for very long. Um, but I, but I, thought, I think they've made a, um, a beautiful um, installation of the gift. And that's the, really, that's the really key thing for me, is Rodin gave them that material. And they've really thought about how how to present it as you know as as a whole. I'm sure it's not the whole collection, but but not to sort of discriminate between materials, but, but to put them together again because that is what they what they received. So I think um, I think they've done a really nice effort um, in, in doing that. Uh, I just as a follow up, and thinking in terms of I love your, your phrasing of that plaster original, mm -hmm. uh, and I I run into many interesting conversations here at Fairfield World Plaster. That's like poster that you buy at the gift shop that has no value, and I have been able to help people understand they have extraordinary value, right? And obviously the, the casts that we have are not the working casts of the artist. Um, this is something entirely different, and yet at the same time, they take us, they're a portal into a time and a place in a way that is, is quite extraordinary. I absolutely agree, and I'm so glad you said that. Um, they are a portal to this moment in the 19th century when those, the dissemination of this canon through this you know, miraculous medium of plaster, which is so faithful, catches so much detail. And when that was just seen as, um, as an important way for people to be exposed um, to these works. So they are, I mean, they are historical material. And what are we looking for? I mean, when we're looking at those classes, we're not looking for the British Museum Elgin models, you're looking at that thing in its own right. So, um, sort of what I was trying to say about whether we're looking at something or sort of looking through something as a sort of a wishful transporting us into the British Museum, maybe. But that's not what these pieces are, are about. They, they are, I think they're incredibly powerful as, um, as these historical records from that, from that moment when they were so important. Yeah. I, um, and some people have asked, well, is a plaster cast a work of art? And this gets into a lovely nuanced uh, situation. And since usually somebody with great skill and expertise is making the cast, it, they're never exactly the same. Even if it's taken from the same mold, it always, there's always a little bit of difference where the artist gets in there and does something. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think that the you and Harriet and with Harry were all in part of a larger discussion about casts, and they're clearly on a big incline yes, in terms of interest. Correct. Absolutely, yeah. which is great. Um, I would say that the question of whether they're a work of art maybe isn't the most interesting question. <laughs> maybe we need to point in a different direction. Harriet. Um, just to add uh, another angle onto the cast, who are the cast collection for at City College, which was among the first three sets of cast to come to this country. And we, they're now on display at the Grand Youth Center in New York. Um, but what we discovered was because the originals have had such rough treatment, and our casts were made so early before they had suffered some demise, that our casts 
today are closer to the original than the original, which is a concept mm. of still yeah. resting. Yeah, no, absolutely true. Yes, um, and yeah, so they've they've maybe because of their neglect that people haven't interfered with them. Um, yes. You know, are very much still true to their. Yeah. Nobody paid any attention to that. Right. right. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm rather shocked by the uh, photos that you showed of the original display at, on the Rudalma. And uh, I, I wonder if what Rodin would think about this kind of display where we have these very neutral pedestals. And <laughs> is it a distortion of his work or his intentions? Do you have any ideas about that? Well, I think he was an incredibly commercial artist and he made, he made and he gifted his collection to the state. and. This was his his will for them to be reproduced in perpetuity. I don't think he controlled how people, how owners, private collectors, for instance, would have set them up. So they're gone, and I think he would have been happy to let them go. Um, I think. I mean, I think what's interesting about this, and I think about this, you know, at, uh, at my museum too, is um, I do find it odd that we're happy to put. And I'd love to know what you think, Michelle. We're happy to put sculptures onto these pedestals. Um, you know, MDF, painted wood. But we wouldn't, we'd never show a painting <laughs> not framed beautifully. So there is, there is a sort of a weird thing about sculpture where our convention and the expediency um, of how we display them has kind of taken over and this, the pedestals kind of disappear, or, or they do for me in the sense that, you know, that this is what we do, this is our museum practice. Um, but I think it is worth a thought that, that, that um, painting frames, which are also a very important area of study, I think much more so than pedestals, um, that we, we, you know, museums care a lot about picture frames. You know, it's a, it's a big, and it's a big expense, and we want to make a historical frame. If there isn't one, we wouldn't show a picture unframed. Um, but with sculptures, it's, we've gone beyond that, and it's okay to be expedient. So I don't know exactly why that is, but I would love to buy um, a historical <coughs> collection of pedestals for my museum. You know, these variegated, columns, um, marble columns, or wood painted to look like marble, which you see so commonly you know, um, in um, 18th and 19th century collections, to see um, what would happen if, if, we, if we did our displays like that and thought about our pedestals more like picture frames. I don't know. What do you think, Michelle? Well, Carrie and I were just saying that we were sort of made nervous by that historical picture of how narrow and tall they are. Oh, yes, <laughs> very true. You notice our nice, bulky, <laughs> we're trying to make them not get toppled over, but clearly Rodin was not concerned about stability. Is that right. how he said it? And he was showing plasters on those right. flimsy pedestals, yes. <laughs> when we were doing the installation for this, we looked at a lot of um, other museums to see how other people were installing them, and I was... I was really surprised by how many people were not doing what you suggest, but using color on the pedestals in some really surprising ways that, to my eye, was distracting. Oh, interesting. So that was why I chose this more yeah. neutral, as you described, um, warm but neutral. I, I, I found the, the colors, I, I found yeah. them really, I mean, some installations had different colors, you know, right. kind of by section yeah um, and I know exactly what you're talking about yes <laughs> no, absolutely and I, I decided I did not want to go that route <laughs> yeah we're in a Louis Kahn building with linen walls right. and brown carpets and um, our kind of mantra is to go neutral yeah. as well and to try and just make them sort of disappear yeah you're not really looking at them yeah. yes what role does contrast play like color contrast uh, in some of these curations, like in the original Rodin One Man Show, he had a black backdrop to the whole thing with his plasters, and in here we have the the light colors with the dark bronze. But in the recreation of the Rodin Show, it, it was all cream colors. That's true. Yeah, I noticed that when I was looking back at these pictures, and I can't answer your question. I don't know if they talk about it in the catalogue, but it's a really great point, and I wonder what color that wall was. You know, was it red? Was it, you know, if he, I don't know if um, in the world of uh, the science of photography whether they might actually know the answer to that, but I would be so fascinated to know what the colors might have been. But yeah, it's, that's really difficult, um, a really difficult question to answer because photography was black and white. Um, but sometimes we have records about colors, written records, or, um, you know, in the case of 
big exhibitions at the Royal Academy or the Great Exhibition, we have lots of you know, pictures, drawings um, that were made. And so we, we can kind of think of period colors, um, but I can't answer your question and it's a really good one. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Draft. Thank you all.